Hello, Comics Alternative fans. Before we start with the episode, we want to invite all of you to check out our Patreon campaign. That's right. Go to www.patreon.com slash comics alternative for more details. There you'll find more information about the campaign and the cool rewards levels we have. For as little as $1 a month, you can help us maintain good quality comics talk. And the more you contribute, the more perks you get. These include monthly podcast episodes exclusive to Patreon supporters, as well as the chance to help us choose which books we review on the show. So be sure to visit www.patreon.com slash comics alternative and become one of our proud podcast patrons. Yeah, and now on with the show. This is the Comics Alternative for Young Readers, reviews of Volcano Trash and Real Friends. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Gwen. And I'm Paul, and we're two academics talking about comics for young readers. On this episode of the Comic Alternative's Young Reader Show, we will discuss Real Friends by Shannon Hale and Lee Wynn Pham from First Second, and we'll also be reviewing Volcano Trash by Ben Sears from Koyama Press. Before we start today's show, I want to remind everybody that our program is sponsored by Discount Comic Book Service. Head over to DC, sir, DCBService.com for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. Every week, DCBS has DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles for 40% off, and many other publishers' comics regularly run between 20 and 35% off the list price. In fact, DCBS sometimes has comics that run 45 to 50% off the cover price, and sometimes the discounts are more impressive than that. So head over to DCBService.com or their sister site, In Stock Trades, for all of your comics needs. One of the ways that you can take advantage of Discount Comic Book Service's great discounts is to seize on their bundles. And each month, um, there are bundles uh, specifically for kids. This month, there's a DC Kids bundle that features titles like Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, Scooby-Doo Team Up, and Teen Titans Go, all for 50% off the cover price. DCBS also has a Marvel Kids bundle that um, this month includes Marvel Universe Ultimate Spider-Man vs. The Sinister Six and Marvel Universe Guardians of the Galaxy, also for 50% off the cover price. All these great deals, um, along with the other steals that are available on comics for all ages, uh, can be found at Discount Comic Book Service. That is right. And when you do order with DCB Service, be sure to tell them that Paul and Gwen sent you. <laughs> all right. So this month we have some really exciting comics that we're going to be talking about. Um, very different comics, wouldn't you say, Paul? That's right. Yeah, a good pairing a nice contrast yeah absolutely and so you know i think why don't we go ahead and start off with um volcano trash by ben sears Well, Volcano Trash is out this month from Koyama Press, um, this, this being May of 2017. And it's Ben Sears' follow-up to last year's um, book, Night Air, which was also from Koyama, and features his double-plus heroes who appeared in that book and have also appeared in various zines and online anthologies. And now they're the stars of, of Volcano Trash. Um, it's a sci-fi adventure story. Um, it's exciting, and it's uh, it's got very kid-friendly cartooning. And the story's heroes are a plus man who is a kid <laughs> who wears jeans and a striped t-shirt and these super cool goggles uh, and what looks like maybe like an aviator cap or something. Right. And he's always accompanied by his robot buddy, Hank, from whom we see a really cool trick in this story. Um, but Night Air the, from last year saw the pair in a kind of caper story. And so at the start of Volcano Trash, they're in Bolt City, which is this very technological uh, sci-fi kind of city. And they're being sought by the police um, 
wanted, as the wanted poster says, for thievery, thievery and destruction of property. <laughs> <laughs> part of their hijinks. And uh, in this in this volume, we see them taking on a huge corporate power called labyrinth um and ready for more adventures and so you know um the uh, solicit t- text actually puts it really well for this uh story it's uh um you know hijinks and uh you know um all kinds of wacky adventures and uh you know part of uh, part of the fun of reading volcano trash so i'm curious gwen what you thought of um uh, volcano trash. Well, I'd really enjoyed Night Air in part mm-hmm. because of the personalities of the villains. Um, That's right. <laughs> you know, and and this is one of those kind of comics that reminds me a little bit of a series that was very popular when I was a kid, and it was um, the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. And mm. um, it, but it sort of felt like it feels sort of like that meets Hergé, you know, because uh, the, right. the, the, the style itself, um, is, is a sort of very close to clear line. You're able right. to follow the characters very well because they're always drawn the same way. Um, right. and, Hergé, of course, the creator of Tintin for those. Right. Who Absolutely. That. Absolutely. And, and yet at the same time, you have hijinks and goofiness and very clever banter. Um, yeah. and so that I found really amusing. I, I think earlier when we we were talking um, about this episode, I said I'd compared it to sort of, um, you know, Hergé meets Law and Order because <laughs> because <laughs> right. I think what distinguishes Night Air from this text is that hmm. with Night Air, like the good, the evil, everything was pretty easily set out and the, there was right. a lot of slapstick and humor. Well, there's still slapstick and humor in this volume, but actually there's a lot of really pretty deep philosophical discussion about um, the ne'er-do-well large conglomerate that is mm-hmm. is sort of, you know, oppressive and problematic. And the, the characters talk to each other a lot like the characters do on a typical action-adventure TV show. So there's a lot of, right. for kids who like that kind of thing, I think they're really going to like this text. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, I think that it's funny. I, I often felt as a kid in a library, like there was something that would have perfectly suited a certain taste of mine that I just couldn't find enough of, especially in modern comics. And that was kind of exactly the gap that Tintin filled so well. You know, the space that Tintin holds on the shelf is for that kind of action adventure that isn't sort of darkened and gloomied up by this very American aesthetic at least since James Fenimore Cooper and and t- and covers that went with those books or superhero comics or Star Wars and Star Trek kind of adventure you know i think those were the kind of fare that a lot of kids were into if they were looking for adventure and realism but there just wasn't the kind of playful and fun cartooniness that um you could see in a lot of european comics um and i feel like this does a really good job of filling that yeah, and you know, another thing that it references, especially in this volume, is the concept of transformers. You know, not only just the fact that the little robot can transform into lots of different and very handy, might I add, accessories right. um, for Plus Man, but also um, the, the the police officers. Um, they, they look like yeah. sort of average donut-eating police officer guys, but then they, <laughs> they transform out into something else. And, and so there are ways in which, um, just from a visual standpoint, this comic yep. is, is really fun. And I, I love those scenes. And this is so, you're so right to, to tag this to European comics because mm. a lot of times I've noticed in children's comics, um, and especially in the Franco Belgian tradition, there's a tendency to use arrows and other means mm-hmm. to show the action unfolding and the right. order in which you're supposed to watch the characters going through sort of very, physical machinations but of course right. comics are static well there's a couple of scenes there where arrows or other physical indicators are used to show how you're supposed to watch the plus man go through some fighting sequence and it's it really right. adds to the visuals i think yeah yeah totally i mean it there are parts of this that have as you said the feeling of really classic kinds of um uh, Franco-Belgian comics and, um, adventure stories. I think there's also an element that includes the way that technology is integrated and the robot stuff and, and, and also just the way that the scenes are laid out. That reminds me a lot of the influence of video games. You know, right. um, 
the sort of leveling up idea and, and sort of the, the left to right motion logic, getting through these obstacles and enemies to reach an objective. And, um, I'm not a bit, I've never been a big gamer. Uh, I think it's part of my deprived childhood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I never had a big system or something like that. But I just know that the way that, um, kids' imaginations are very much think of along the lines of, you know, how, not, not all kids, but, uh, many kids along the lines of how do I resourcefully get past these obstacles and these barriers right. to, you know, get to the other side? That kind of, um, puzzling out a solution to that problem. You know, you can feel the, the dynamism of this story, take advantage of that. And there's this sense of motion that, that there's a one scene in particular, not to give too much away. Whereas you were saying those arrows indicate a really cool kind of move that plus man does to, um, to, you know, uh, kick a foe and flip backwards to jump on his hover bike. Right. So need I say more than that to, to show how fun this is. And you know, on the one <laughs> hand, plus man has a lot of the characteristics that we'd associate with a superhero. Um, right, right. you know, he has certain extra abilities. He's clever. He's crafty, but there yeah. are also things about him that <laughs> remind me of myself as a kid. He's always late. Right. In fact, <laughs> my mom used to say to me, Gwen, you're a day late and a dollar short a lot of the time. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, she was right. saying it in a joking way, yeah, but, yeah. but there's ways in which plus man is that way too and and that leads to a lot of the the close calls and the sort of excitement of this comic because right. you know a lot of times he he really cuts it pretty closely and things could go really badly and and usually they right. don't but it's part of the the joy of the comic is will yeah. he get out of this this mess that he's kind of put himself into yeah yeah absolutely and and you know a part of this and as you said there's a contrast a little bit in terms of who the enemy is in the previous story in night air compared to this but i do think that embedded in this classic you know kids adventure story uh there's this trope of of being on the run from a, a very corrupt adult world you know the mm -hmm. the authorities and police kind of in collusion with the the corporation and stuff like that and um and I love that the story handles all that without this, um, spence, I don't know, it, it doesn't have the same sense of shadowy conspiratorial danger. It keeps it, um, fun. And I, I think that, um, that is one way in which you, you know, get kids to think about and, um, and just kind of imagine, uh, how, how do you navigate a, a world that often feels to a kid like everybody's conspiring against you? Yeah, um, absolutely. That, that kind of feeling in the story. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is it doesn't have heavy handed morality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I actually leave this text thinking, wow, there, there is a good, there is an evil perhaps, but there's a lot of shades in between sure. there. And, <laughs> sure. um, you know, these aren't perfect kids, right? Or a kid right. and robot. Um, right. and the adults are certainly not perfect either, but there's no sense of that kind of, you know, like 1950s, 60s superhero. And now let's think about what we've learned kids. Right. You know, that, right. that is not, this is not a preachy comic. Um, yeah. by any means. And so yeah. it was, it was just a lot of fun to read. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I, and I think that, you know, kind of at the center of it, particularly in this narrative is the, um, is, is a, is a kind of bond between Hank and, um, and plus man, you know, that there's a part of the story again, not trying to give too much away, but you think a little bit about how being separate from Hank is not just losing a tool, you know, as you would, if you lost, um, a weapon or, a, a, or something like that. Um, and it's also not just losing a buddy. It's kind of losing both. And I thought a little bit about how, um, folks might be able to relate to this book, thinking about how these days, you know, when you lose a valuable piece of technology, we used to think about stories with the theme of technology alienating us from other humans. But uh -huh. I think that the way we interact with technology and how much that facilitates a kind of human or emotional contact for us, you know, sometimes being alienated from technology is being is being alienated from social contact or from humans. And so I, I think a little bit about how the sense of loss when um, Hank and um, Plus Man aren't together is a little bit of the emotional core. Again, not heavy handed at all, but, right. um, you know, is, is part of the emotional drama of the story. Right. And, you yeah. know, in some ways, Hank plays a very important role for Plus Man. He seems yeah. Hank really does seem to understand a lot about the world. He's an old soul. And so um, the loss is is real. I mean, it mm -hmm. it and and 
Don't worry, though. Everything turns out okay in the end. Kids. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Um, <laughs> actually, maybe we should think about, you know, um, this seems like a, a comic that could be really fun for almost any age kid reader, but I think it's probably most designated for late elementary, early middle school. But again, there's a lot that's going on here. I mean, I wasn't joking when I said it reminds me a little of Law and Order because a lot of procedural, <laughs> a lot of procedural yep. stuff gets talked about here by, by the authorities, by, yeah. by plus men and, and Hank. And right. uh, so, you know, that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, and I, I agree about the, the target age range. And, you know, um, I, I also agree about the sort of, you know, level of profundity to expect, which is not necessarily a ton, you know, right. um, but that doesn't mean that it can't have um, some some good effect uh, on kids just enjoying reading and thinking a little bit about as we were talking about relationships and, you know, technology and solving puzzles and things like that. Um, I do l- enjoy the fact that as we've had this conversation, Gwen, we haven't said what others would might might attach to this, which is a gendered notion of who the reader or the target reader uh, of this is. Um, because plus man is... Um, a male, you know, pre- presents as a male kind of character. And I think there's a real uh, temptation to say, oh, this is a comic for boys. Um, but as we'll also talk about with our next title, that's, um, I think, an error in a lot of ways uh, for us to think about it that way. Yeah. And, you know, it's true. I mean, not only is, have we, we also haven't really talked too much about Basil, who is mm-hmm. sort of the the guy who is in charge of the 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 uh, I don't even know how to put it um the vehicle that contains yes. the other things that they, like the 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 their their car essentially that's right except right. it's not a car it does a lot more so it's sort of hard to describe their multi-purpose right. vehicle and basil right. sort of looks at the relationship between plus man and and hank in a sort of rueful way i mean you get right. the sense that he knows oh these two guys are going to cause me more trouble but right. but i i love them you know so there's you're right there's all these friendships and it is a very the characters themselves are all basically male you know i mean that's that's Mm -hmm. it's a very male world and yet i think that all readers would find this to be funny or amusing and um i you know shannon hale whom we're going to talk about in a moment actually went on twitter a couple days ago to talk about real friends the book we're about Mm -hmm. to talk about and one of the points she made was this is a book about girls but I wouldn't call it a book for girls. And we'll talk. Right. I, I don't want to, to to steal the thunder from sure. Shannon for 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 that part of our discussion. But sure. I say I would say the same thing about this book. The the human relationships are are ones that any reader can identify with, and anybody who's had a close friend, um, who's gotten into to some scrapes, who right. who's somewhat adventurous, etc. You know, I think anyone can can really identify with this. This isn't yeah. some macho comic. Right. Yes. I mean, in fact, yeah. I would argue that machismo is denigrated in this comic. Yes. Yeah. Um, in many ways. So. Yeah, I think it's subtle, but it's a, it is, a, I think, a positive trend in a lot of these books in, in which, you know, there's nothing explicit or even, I think, implicit that's meant to shout, this is for boys only. And I think the fact that the story emphasizes ingenuity, the fact that this, the, the adventure kind of, you know, um, takes a kind of um devilish uh devil may care risk taking and and um kind of adventuresomeness and and you know i think not advertising that as a gendered thing is really important because i think that's another way in which we start constructing our kids very young to say you know boys do this and are this and girls do this and are this and so i, I think it is the kind of story that um Really, yeah, kids, kids of whatever sort of, um, background can seize on and find fun and also identify with. Um, you know, these days gamers come of every stripe, <laughs> I find, you know, right. Um, ki- kids who are into adventure and, and problem solving and stuff like that and technology are also of, of every kind. And, uh, and we ought to embrace that. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really interesting because Bolt City itself, there's there's kids of all different types running right. around in the background and clearly doing their own thing, too. And yeah. so the whole milieu actually is of just a, a variety of, of children, adults, 
and machines or robots who are very right. humanoid themselves. And so, you know, it's, it's, I, I just think it's, it's, it just so happens we're following plus man and Hank yeah. and Basil really closely in this text. But one of the things that I'm noticing is since it appears that this is a series that's going to continue and mm-hmm. uh, this location is going to continue to be centered in it, I think we'll probably see other characters emerging as Sears goes on too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah, it does seem like we'll see more of this. So uh, I think it'll be fun. I'll I'll follow along. Oh, and one more word. I, I think uh, Koyama does a really good job of presenting this. It's um in a format that's um kind of uh, a little bit unusual on the shelves in terms of size and uh and you know good good paper stock and and so forth. So there's a uh, there's a way where this is you know all of that publication stuff reflects a little bit of you know really holding this up as something worth keeping and enjoying again and again. There's and, a, uh, there's a lot nice. of care. I agree that went into creating this comic and we haven't even talked about the coloring, which maybe oh, um, we yeah. can like just do that really briefly. Um, yeah. There's a really effective use of color in this comic and it's subtle at first. I didn't pick it up in my first read, but going through mm. and then really looking at color um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> for instance, the color red is very often associated in this comic with not necessarily the most awesome folks. And so mm. you start to notice that there's a, there's a sort of over, all sort of very neutral, pleasant background to mm-hmm, the drawings, mm-hmm. but but very often um, a character's emotions um, come through. So, for instance, um, when Plus Man is really upset about something and he's sort of talking about how he's aggrieved about it, he, everything else disappears in the background. It's just him, right. and the background is this sort of very lime green kind of almost looks like a storm is coming or brewing. Yeah. And so, you know, there are ways in which, um, again, uh, Sears is using close up is using color to convey yeah. emotion in a really sophisticated way. Yeah. Yeah. And probably worth noting again, uh, although it probably shouldn't, shouldn't need to be said that this is a hundred percent Sears. It seems there's no credits for other letterers or colorists or, uh, whatever. So, you know, it seems like he's, um, yeah, he's really lending full cartooning talents to that. And, and that includes the color. I agree. The color is really deftly done. And I remember you saying this about Jordi Belair in our last episode that you would love to have her, uh, choose your outfits and furnish your, you know, your furnishings right. for your home this, in the same way. I think Sears is, um, color choices here, um, would be a, a pretty cool, um, office or, or bedroom, uh, it's, you know, palette for, uh, for you know this kind of scene. So yeah, I'm I like sh- it. I'm pretty sure that Plus Man buys Scandinavian furniture for his apartment. <laughs> um, and his cat is awesome too because even though the cat just says meow, um yeah. the it's like Plus man knows what the cat is saying and they have this whole right. conversation. And so, right. you know, I'm a, th- I'm a, I have a thing for pets. So, so there's cute animals <laughs> in this and there's lots of like, sometimes even just in the background, there'll be a really cute dog. So that really makes me like Ben Sears even more. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, Paul, that was a great discussion about volcano trash. Um, but now we're going to move into the realm of memoir with Shannon Hale's Real Friends. And she collaborated with Lee Wen Pham on this wonderful book for young adults. Um, they both have created a text that may be about young girls and their friendships, hence the title Real Friends. But the text should have resonance for any young reader since the desire to fit in with a friend group is one that most people experience growing up. In fact, in a recent interview with Scholastic, Hale underscored this point, noting that, quote, just because a book is about girls doesn't mean it's for girls. Can you imagine if you'd only ever read books that reflect your own personal life experience? And yet we try to do that to boys. If it's about girls, then it can't be for boys, because how on earth could they relate? Of course, books can be mirrors and they can be windows. As adults, we need to get out of the kids' way and stop telling them what they shouldn't be reading, unquote. And I thought that was such an in- 
<clears throat> interesting and timely comment, um, yes. especially because I think as more and more comics creators <clears throat> are writing about experiences like friendship and the two texts that we're talking about today, um, mm-hmm. you know, we have this unfortunate idea in society that we can't learn from each other. And it's true that as young people, very often kids do segregate. I mean, almost every character in Real Friends is a girl just as almost every character in Volcano Trash is a young man. Um, but these young men and young women can learn a lot from each other. And I love that Shannon Hale is addressing that so directly. Yeah, I, you know, we'll, we'll get into the story in detail a little bit more. But I think that overall, I felt like this was a text that I personally related to even more strongly than something like Volcano Trash. Um, the You know, despite having been categorized as a boy my whole life, as male my whole life. But I I often, you know, would bump up against this expectation as a kid that as a boy, I was less interested in certain things. And yet this is the story that reading it now, and I actually, I think reading it when I, reading a, a story like this when I was a kid, I would have not only related to, but appreciated. Like I, I needed it. I needed it to help me sort through what were for me really big and pressing issues about how to get along and how to fit in and how to, um, you know, navigate the, the dynamics of inclusion and exclusion that so much of childhood is for better or for worse about. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the actual text. Um, it's Technically, it's being marketed as a middle grade novel, although I could see younger and older readers enjoying it. It's set in the late 1970s and early 1980s in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's a memoir that Hale had wanted to write after watching her own daughter develop a love for reading after being drawn into, surprise, surprise, Telgemeier's Smile <laughs> and other texts like that. Um, in an interview with book writer this month, she explained that, quote, I have a daughter who would not be a reader if not for graphic novels. Graphic novels are really an important format for so many readers. There are things that happened in my elementary school years that I would retell to people, and I thought maybe I'd use it as fodder for a book, fictionalizing. And she said, seeing how much graphic novels have meant to my daughter, I thought it would be the right format. And Real Friends begins um, with Shannon feeling left out in her large suburban family. Her older sisters, who are close in age, have always been good friends. And her younger siblings, also close in age, are bonded. And Shannon feels like the odd one out. And her desire to have a best friend becomes really a complicated quest, since the dynamics of young people's friendships often involve cliques, popularity contests, and they're often very much not about the real connection um, between kids. Yeah. You know, I'm going to stop here. We're at four minutes because it sounded like we've got a thunderstorm. Yeah. Woo! It's gotten worse. I'm sorry. I keep trying to, I keep hearing it get worse and then I try to cut in to try to um, fix it and it's really gotten worse. I'm... Do you want to just uh. not use a use your um is it do you think it's your cable to your headphones it could be so what i have is i have a mic that's connected by usb Uh and then i have headphones that come out of that mic to um and so the the cable that i'm fidgeting with that winds up making a difference is the usb cable that maybe you need to just use your your embedded mic because even though there'd be a bit of a resistance i bet it would take that fuzziness off sorry Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say maybe you just want to plug your microphone into your device and, uh, I mean, get rid of your microphone altogether for this and just plug in your headphones to your device. Because yeah. actually it's really um, quiet right now. Yeah, it seems to have paused. But okay. <laughs> well, then I'm, I'm a little scared. <laughs> okay. we, we could keep, we could try. We could keep okay. Going and, uh, um, yeah. Well, Derek, I'm going to go ahead. Um, we're at five minutes now. Um I'm going to go ahead and where I stopped at, um, as young adults, we need to get out of the way. I'm going to go back now and do that middle grade novel part, which is the description of the text. So we're now at 549. This middle grade novel, which is set in the 1970s and early 1980s in Salt Lake City, Utah, is a memoir that Hale wanted to write after watching her own daughter develop a love for reading after being drawn to, not surprisingly, Raina Telgemeier's smile. Um, In a recent interview, she pointed out that, um, that 
for many readers who are reluctant to read graphic novels are a great gateway for that. And she thought it would be the right format for this story. Um, Real Friends begins with Shannon, um, the protagonist and obviously the author, feeling left out in her large suburban family. And I should interject here that some of the names have been changed in this story. There's a really good author's note at the end of the text that explains that. But um, for the most part, this is a realistic depiction um, as best as Hale could do of her childhood. And in her family, um, she had two older sisters who were close in age and had always been good friends. And her younger siblings are also close in age and have the same interests. And Shannon has felt like the odd one out. We meet her when she's, you know, preschool age, but um, pretty quickly, the majority of the story takes place in second through fifth grade. Um, Her desire is to have a best friend, and it becomes a really complicated quest since the dynamic of young people's friendships often involve cliques, popularity contests, and things like that, rather than kids trying to find a real connection with each other and establishing, you know, uh, their their place in the hierarchy. A lot of it yeah, often is, yeah. is you know, just who's popular at this moment and, and how, how does that person think about me? That, that often is the issue. So as Shannon struggles to become part of a clique of girls who are called just generically the group, <laughs> she often <laughs> finds herself feeling afraid and she compensates in a number of ways, including some mildly obsessive compulsive behaviors, um, which she addresses again in the author's note. And as the story unfolds, another narrative emerges. Shannon's older sister, Wendy, also experiences problems fitting in and sometimes does take her anger out on Shannon. So you really have both sisters um, having problems at school and bringing those home. Um, Mm. Although Real Friends delves into difficult topics, it really does so with gentle humor and should be relatable to any child who has felt left out. In fact, this author's note that Hale provides explains that she, you know, wants to make sure that kids know that they have help available to them if they're experiencing anxiety or having trouble fitting in. And she also offers a hopeful message for young kids who experience bullying, which is such an important topic. Um, I, I, before we get into to a discussion of it, I also want to really mention that Lee Wen Pham's artistry really contributes to the overall message of the book. Um, yes. In a school library journal interview, Pham explained how her own experiences with mean friends impacted her illustration. She says, quote, who hasn't had mean friends? I'm going to stick my neck out there and suggest that anyone who has the slightest inclination towards the artistic life has most likely suffered under some friend in this way. If I hadn't, she said, she, it's so funny, she said, if I hadn't experienced these same things, I don't think I could have done this book. What's hard, though, is drawing it as an adult where you might know better why someone behaves mm. in such an awful fashion. And she said, I was tempted many times to draw the character of Jenny, who becomes a, an key antagonist in the text um, to Shannon in a more sympathetic light. But that's the trick. There's a balance to these things, an understanding of whose story you're trying to tell. If I lent more weight to Ginny's expressions, it would be a different story. And in fact, what I think makes this book so visually stunning is the way that Pham uses close-ups especially to show how Shannon is feeling. So even if as adults reading this text, we can understand that the kids are all insecure, that they're all acting from um, you know, a variety of motivators that, you know, as kids, we're not always aware of each other having. The text is written so beautifully from Shannon's viewpoint that honestly, you know, when I was a kid, I had some of these same issues growing up. And I was the mm-hmm. one at the nurse's office with the sick stomach, but really not because I was sick to my stomach because of any health right. issue, but because, well, it was a health issue. It was anxiety over friendship problems. Right. And right. I just there's a there's a scene where Shannon is curled up in the nurse's office and it just brought back a flashback, a literal flashback to my childhood. So, you know, (laughs) this is a really powerful text visually, and I don't want to lose sight of that because obviously it's a memoir. So we're going to be talking about Hale's intentionality here. But I do believe that Lee Wen Pham really, you know, is a co-creator in this and Hale, you know, suggests that herself in interviews. And it's really a fine collaboration. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there is an interesting thinking about authorship here, right? Because it's autobiographical in, in, you know, in most senses of it. And yet being a collaboration, a partnership between Hale as writer and Pham as artist means that it's, um, I mean, I mean, just as a autobiographical film would, 
involve an interpretation by actors and by cinematographers and by directors and so and so forth, even if the the person whose whose life it depicts is involved in the storytelling, it's always still filtered through this collaborative effort. Um, the the same is true here. We know that this is Hale's um, story that Fam becomes a co storyteller in because of her, um, you know, the, the impact of all of the art. Um, but I, I do think that there's something that's so, you know, personal and real that it, it would be believable if this was fiction, but it would obviously be fiction that was written out of a, a, a person's memories of their experiences growing up. I could relate to it, as I said, so much. And, um, I, and actually, I really enjoyed reading this one, and I mention this often, but reading it with my kid, with my daughter, and to, to watch her, she's at the beginning age of where this story is, uh, you know, sort of kindergarten, preschool age, but to see her, <coughs> right. much of her life be a matter of navigating these kind of... Um, as you were saying, social hierarchies and stuff. It's, um, it was very relatable to her too. Yeah. No, I believe if I had had this book when I was in second or third grade, it would have made a huge difference to how I viewed myself, my friends and the world. So, you know, I don't usually get this preachy, but I really have to say that if we have parents listening, this is an amazing book and I highly recommend it. But I would also say to young readers who might be listening to us, even if you're the most popular kid in school, this would be a great book for you because not everybody yeah. is. Not everybody feels comfortable. You know, some people are just naturally more comfortable in making friendships with other people, but that's not everybody. And even if you're fortunate enough to be that person, having a text like this will help you to empathize with other kids. So and just but it's not a preachy mm-hmm. book. I feel really mm-hmm. guilty right now about being <laughs> preachy about this book because Actually, that's not how it comes across um, Mm -hmm. at all to me. I think it's just a very, you just feel like you're right inside this child's mind as she's going through and encountering these things. And I I think it's done really well. Yeah, yeah. And and I think you're right that it's not preachy because it's not um, meant to be just pointing fingers at look at these, um, you know, heartless kids (laughs) who are just ruthlessly, you know, um, being mean girls. It really is a, a reflection on how the character, the protagonist herself, how Shannon feels, you know, and how things make her feel. And, you know, one of the things that I think about a lot is why comics are so appealing to kids and to all of us. Um, what comics can do that, you know, other media don't do as well, or what comics can do that prose does differently. And, you know, I, I think it's great to read. Um, I, I read a lot of fiction and I read a lot with my, my daughter as well. And so, Prose has this way of, you know, getting into people's heads and the sort of thoughts and feelings that, that people go through. That's really, really powerful that I think facilitates some maturation in that. Um, but, but I, I think comics can do some really interesting things too. One of them being that, um, you know, oftentimes as a kid, you will stand in a, in a situation. You'll, you'll be standing in the hallway with your friends of the school and you'll see a sea of faces all at once. And you'll have to try to process a bunch of people's reactions and emotions all at Mm -hmm. the same time. And one of the things that I think um, Hale and Pham do really well that I also see, for instance, Raina Telgemeier taking advantage of is how in in comics scenes, you can depict multiple sort of faces at once and their varied reactions to things. And it makes you wonder and think about, you know, how do different people feel differently in this particular situation in this moment? And I think that kind of um, social acuity, that kind of social um, awareness is something that kids are very interested in. We're all very interested in and that we also have to develop. It's one of the things that I see when I read my, my, with my daughter, she's paying attention, for instance, to what Jenny is, how Jenny is reacting to something that Shannon says, even though Jenny's there in the background. And it, it in a way, it's reading the social situation the way that my daughter is learning to do while she's in the playground or um, you <laughs> right. know, in her classroom. You know, there's a good instance of that on page 41, actually, when Shannon is standing. The the perspective that the reader is encouraged to take in the first panel on the page is Shannon's because she's shown in, in half profile looking yeah. out at the kids on the playground. And it's clear that Jen, one of the kids, is yes. directing the other kids. And um, it's the first time that that the protagonist really is realizing that these kids have a group. And it says, she says, Mm -hmm. I don't know who first named it, but Jen and her friends were called the group. And Mm -hmm. you're sort of getting that from the perspective of, 
of Shannon. And it, yeah. it's she's looking at them, how their body language is working. And we yes. as readers are encouraged to do that. And again, I just yeah. I have to say Fam really is is probably very much involved in that too. She's so good at this. In fact, in, in the school library journal interview that um, was done with both of them, um, mm-hmm. uh, it's so funny, Shannon Hale said, it's like you're psychic. It's like you just got inside my brain and, <laughs> and knew what it was like. And and again, I think Fam's right. She says, look, we've all gone through through this, right? Yeah, Most of us have yeah. had something like this, but it's done really well. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think another dimension that I appreciate, you know, and it's probably it's connected, um, is that what comics also can do, uh, that prose does, but maybe in a different way, is to show what's in someone's imagination. And so, for instance, Shannon experiences right. her sister who she's you know, often afraid of because of her emotional ups and downs as a bear. <laughs> and, gets, and she gets to depict, you know, her as a bear or, or in other scenes where the group is a little scarier and, and, you know, they can do sort of a worm's eye view of the group and they look scary or really, you know, a lot of the friendships and relationships are built on imaginative play and whether, um, you know, Shannon's ideas about how to play will be picked up on by her friends and mm-hmm. they'll join her in that imaginative escape. And I think that the ability to do that in, through comics art is really, really um, a, a kind of an important, you know, way of extending your own imagination into reality. And, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. Well, I was just going to say that I, I so agree and I'm so glad you brought that up because that also then sa- you know shows that this text also has implications as a Kunstler roman or a coming of age mm-hmm. narrative that focuses on an artist because yeah. we know as as adults and as kids know it too reading it Shannon Hale is very well known for writing fantasy fiction that's what she's right. best known for and right. we see very early on that those impulses are very strong in her and yes. and you're right comics you can you could write a, a text only narrative where you said you know Shannon pretended that she and her friend were wonder women right and we're saving the day (laughs) but it's when you can see sort of the times when she and her friends are on the exact same page so that the way that they're imagining the scenarios are similar but then other times where she's imagining something and her friends don't see it that way and the way that fam draws that makes that very clear that they're not sharing in her fantasy world and you're right i mean that's just such a great comics thing you know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's some of that in, um, Princess, the Princess in Black series that Shannon Hale writes. Um, and I think that, if I'm not right. mistaken, is illustrated or, uh, by, by fam. I, right. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I remember kind of enjoying that and recognizing that. And part of me thinking, Hey, this would be great comics, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so to see it kind of come to fruition here is cool. You know, and I would, it's interesting because I've been thinking about the difference, some of the differences between the two comics we've looked at today. And there's mm. a, cute set of scenes in um in volcano trash where plus man is is just it's it's the sad part of the comic where things are not going right. his way and he's he's sitting he he loses he plays a video game and he loses and it says you're a loser and he's at the quote unquote bar drowning his sorrows in soda pop and right. <laughs> and he and basil are sort of sitting there and he's like one of those detectives on a tv detective show when the case has gone cold and he's miserable yeah. and okay so, but in that fictive reality, these things are really happening to this character. They're yeah. in fantasy. So as adults, especially readers, we are seeing what it's referencing. What I find yeah. really interesting in contrast is in Real Friends, the text is grounded in reality. The everyday lives of average kids are being portrayed, but it's the right. fantasy life that they're sort of playing that yeah. that is really depicted here in such a rich detail. That's why I really like that we, we didn't mean to, but we read these books together um, right. and by accident because they both came out this month, but the reality reality is that they they both make interesting commentary on fantasy and yeah. on you know as readers even like if your daughter were if you read this with both books with your daughter she would get that difference right she would understand yes. that plus man isn't going back to some other reality somewhere else this is his reality right. whereas shannon desperately wants to be in a fantasy like this and right. and is is trying to find someone who will go along with her Yeah, yeah. And that's such a, um, you know, I think it's such a remarkable and important thing for kids, figuring out the overlay of imagination and the imaginative life 
and the sort of <laughs> mundane reality we have to live every day, you know? Right. One of the nicest things about this book to, and, and I, I you know, I, I think this is connected, but maybe seems a, a little bit of a tangent, but one of the nice things about the book is that in the, as you said, at the end of it, um, there's an, a two page author note. Mm -hmm. And then actually Hale goes ahead and includes her school photographs yeah. from kindergarten <laughs> through fifth grade, which are, you know, really cute and, and fun to see. But, you know, f for my daughter, as we read it, reading the whole story and then coming to the end and being reminded that this is a real human being mm -hmm. who, you know, r really a team of human beings, but uh, a real person who is behind these stories and experiences. I think it felt a little bit like I went with you on an imaginative thing, but you were teaching me something about regular everyday life that you experienced and the possibility of all of this sort of um, being with you in your imaginative world and reconciling that with my daily life and my experiences of my friends who look a lot like, you know, you or, or, right. the, or the, or the kids that you picture. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I don't know. It's something about the authors making the, making themselves a little bit more transparent and present that, um, is part of the overall effect, um, uh, on, on readers. Um, I'm sure that comes with some risks, you know, for the, mm -hmm. the creators, but I, I, I do think it's also part of the service that they do, um, in being, you know, public writers. Really. Right. And, you know, one of the things that's nice about those pictures, I love them as well. And <laughs> they underscored something that I think is really central to this text as a whole, which is that there's an incredible amount of development emotionally and intellectually that goes on between kindergarten and fifth grade. I mean, I know uh -huh. that that's obvious, but when you're living every day with a child or you yeah. yourself are a child living through it, it's so <laughs> right, slow right. that you don't see it that way. But it, what the right. what the photos did for me was underscore what I felt was a key message of this text, which is our, our relationship to other people alters drastically during that time period. Because, you know, early on, kids will just play with whoever, you know, their parents tell them right. to play. They slowly begin to develop not only their individuality, but their sense for the place in the spoken but very real hierarchy that develops among kids and yeah. so when you look at those pictures of Shannon in the back you see her physical like from her baby teeth in kindergarten to her regular teeth <laughs> as a fifth grader her hair her her confidence level you see everything shifts and alters for her and it, it's just on because it's on two pages and right there for you. It's it's so immediate. But the mm -hmm. book really does take you through those stages as well. And that's mm -hmm. why I think it's such a valuable text, because without again, without being preachy or heavy handed, I think mm -hmm. that it it does sort of show how we slowly transition into finding the people who are going to treat us with respect. And we yeah. learn how to try to treat other people with respect, even if they're different from us. And I think right. that text, this text really does a good job of that. Yeah. It also yeah, makes me I glad agree. not to be a kid again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good thing we're past that. I know. Good thing we're adults with no no such problems. Oh yeah, it's, it's right. And we both know that it goes on throughout your oh, whole life. But but there's just a way in yeah. which your friendships as a kid become so yes like central. Although I yes. will also yeah. say that that the way that people develop perspective is handled in this because some of the kids mm. with whom Shannon interacts that are right. peripheral to the group she joins are kids who come from disadvantaged, um, a, a, especially economically disadvantaged backgrounds, some right. kids who are foster kids. And she herself, looking back, the narrator, right, of this text, which is Shannon, looking mm. back at herself, says, I probably should have realized at the time that this person was going through something. And that's especially right. what the author's note is good for, because I think Hale spends a lot of time saying, hey, you know, I could have probably been better friends with this one kid, but I yeah. I yeah. just was so wrapped up in myself that I wasn't thinking that they were probably experiencing something much worse than what I was going through. And and yeah. so it's a really, I think it's a nice book in that way too. And then it talks about how we slowly develop empathy based yeah. on our, our observation of others and our understanding of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some of that empathy is visible within the story, you know, by the time she is older and in some ways the tables turned socially mm -hmm. uh, in some respects and some of it you know she admits in the author note didn't come until 
far later, you know, right. and I think we look back at our own childhoods and, and the, the times and when, when we have had a little bit of cachet, when we were a little bit cool and maybe we weren't, um, cool w- about it, you know, <laughs> maybe we weren't the most, um, generous, uh, when we had a chance to be at the top and things like that. Right. I mean, that kind of introspection that a story like this can encourage is, um, healthy, I think. Yeah. And I think that the part of what that comes down to is it's easy to be careless for, especially for, I mean, I've, I've found that in my own yeah. life that, that sometimes, you know, if you're riding high, you can, you maybe feel like you can be care, a little careless. And, and I think Shannon, you know, comes to understand that about herself as well, if not entirely as a kid, as an adult looking back. And it's interesting because I've thought about in the past too writing a fictional account of my own childhood or semi fictional account mm. of it. And, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> what's always sort of kept me from doing that is, you know, that, that in drag that we're going to hide, hide the identities to protect the, you know, <laughs> I, the innocent or whatever. And, um, and she, she addresses that both here and she's been addressing it on Twitter, the, the feelings that she had about mm-hmm. writing about people. She said, some people are going to look at this from my childhood and they're going to see this entirely differently. They're going to say, wait, I wasn't that way. And she's like, I just want to say up front, you know, that this was how I saw things at the time. Sure. But but I, right. I understand that anxiety and I really think her yeah. honesty about about the what goes on when one writes a memoir is really yes. is really helpful um yeah. to to especially to young readers who especially those readers who are interested in becoming writers themselves because this book is a little bit meta as well. You know, it, right. it does yeah. sort of delve into to that both through the narration and the author's note. Yeah, yeah. That is really interesting. I think if I ever did write a book, though, I, my peers and I would both agree that I was an enormous dork. So oh no, Paul, I wouldn't have that is not possible. <laughs> have no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I no, was pretty absolutely. dorky too. It's so funny because because as an adult, you look back and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm that. I was that person, you know, a little miss know it all, you know, et cetera. Right. Really, Hermione Granger, the the character of Hermione Granger, I, that's pretty much that's me. Funny. Only not as good uh, with the spells and things, but <laughs> so. <laughs> Best friend said I, said that I'm a Ron. Well, there Moron you go. Here, See, so, so what can you say? We we all we all find ourselves in fiction at one point or another. That's right. That's right. <laughs> My goal was like someone really cool, but I never quite quite materialized. But that's all right. I can <laughs> I can cool handle in my it. Eyes. So. <laughs> Well, Paul, this has been just such a fun discussion. These two books were really enjoyable to read. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I hope that folks will um, reach out to us with their thoughts and their reactions to the books and and to our discussion. We always enjoy getting um, feedback. And, you know, it's been cool, Gwen, jumping aboard the Young Readers podcast with you. I think this is our third or fourth month um, because I feel like you've um, welcomed me into a larger conversation and it's cool to be part of it. <laughs> well, Paul, I feel that way too. And you're doing such important work in your scholarship right now. And it's oh, exciting to hear you talk about, about that. So it's just, we just have a good time here at the, at the comics alternative in general, but the young readers podcast, I have to say we kind of rock. So um, that's true. Darn it all. <laughs> all right. So um, what we want to do as well is remind folks uh, after listening to our podcast to visit our sponsors, DCBS service and their sister company in stock trades, where you'll, find lots of amazing comics priced anywhere from 20 to 50 percent off the list price and after you do get your comics there as paul said please get in touch with us and let us know what you think of these books you can contact us by going to our website at comicsalternative.com and in the right hand side of your browser you should see a tab that reads send voicemail if you click on that from the comfort of your own desktop or mobile device you can send us a message through the wonders of speakpipe Or if you want to contact us the old school way, you can call us on the telephone. I love that sentence. (laughs) The telephone at 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Or you can contact us by email at two guys at Comics Alternative or get in touch with us individually. I'm Gwen at Comics Alternative. And Paul, how can people reach you? 
I'm Paul at ComicsAlternative.com. Um, you can also find us on Twitter where we will share new content uh, from our podcast and updates to our blog. We're at, at Two Guys with PhDs. That's at the number two guys with PhDs. We're also on social media on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, uh, <laughs> and every other place. And the podcast is available through iTunes or Stitcher or TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Google Play Music. Ooh. That's a lot. And you can (laughs) also discover every single one of our episodes, as well as our reviews and comics-related commentary, on our blog at comicsalternative.com. So until next time, I'm Gwen. And I'm Paul. And let's keep reading. Yay! (laughs) 